today. Um, my name is Margaret DeCoin, and I will be presenting my lecture recital, Melody of a Mood, Experiencing Art and Music at French Impressionism. Um, I've always enjoyed art and exploring connections between music and art, and for my presentation, I want to do just that. And as an artist, I have always been a fan of impressionistic art, and so finding inspiration in different color and aesthetic of style. And basically, I wanted to know more about the art and the music of the period and try to find out what kind of relationships exist between them and how exactly maybe they could influence the piece. So I decided to examine three pieces of music by impressionist composer Claude Debussy with three pieces of artwork. I selected artwork that I felt perfectly embodied Debussy's music in terms of sound, theme, aesthetic, and more. And so today I will perform these compositions for you and give you a brief look at some of the connections I found between the two mediums. But before we go any further, let me give you a brief overview of what exactly Impressionism is. That was fun. <laughs> so basically, Impressionism was an art movement that originated in 19th century France. It brought together a lot of different genres, such as art, music and literature at the time, and where each genre basically influenced one another. Art was all about the artist's perception and sensation of a subject matter. They wanted to create their impression of the moment rather than the actual subject. So this was done through small repeated brush strokes, brighter colors, and they even painted outdoors. Now their art was very vague and sketchy, so the abstractness of music became a perfect medium to project these designs. So when it came to impressionistic music, Composers used more decorative features in their music. They wanted to create pleasure over power, so they used more spontaneity, a lot more color and texture, and a lot more sensuousness. So to get a better idea of these concepts, I will start with my first piece that's titled Le Mise Toile. And the lyrics basically depict a poet who has a personal moment while sitting under a starry night sky and he's singing a song with his lyre and sings of a past love, and it's pretty sad about it. So I felt the piece, Starry Night Over the Rhone by Vincent Van Gogh, really worked to capture that moment of this starry night sky. And overall, <coughs> Debussy interweaves the internal emotions of the singer into the external landscape that is beautifully rendered by Van Gogh. But before we look any closer, I will now perform for you, the week as well, and also, I have included in the program a word-by-word -word translation for all the pieces today. So to better experience the music, I invite you either to enjoy the artwork, to follow along the translation, or just sit back, relax, and listen and follow along.
Um, for instance, Debussy opens me to 12 with a motif of four roll piano chords, and this motif is played every time the chorus occurs, and it kind of varies a little bit every time. This basically creates a very shimmering-like effect, and it's very star-like. And Van Gogh, meanwhile, does this through repetitive brushstrokes, as you can see. And this repetition uses shades of blues and yellows in the piece that creates that shimmering effect and gives it a very dreamlike atmosphere. Another feature is the ABA, BA4, and the chorus is repeated three times. And every time it repeats, it's sung a little softer every time. And this illustrates the poet coming to terms with his personal struggle. And he accepts his past hardships with love, and now he looks forward to the future and hope that he will love again. And this is the case I found that Van Gogh captures the story of the lovers and the two figures that are seen towards the bottom of the painting. And closer look, you notice that the figures overall are very distinct and you can identify them, but a closer look shows in their face are not very distinct. You can't tell their facial features. And I found that really echoes back the uncertainty of the poet as he's struggling between is his love gonna happen or not. So, moving on to my next piece. The next uh, composition that I will sing is called Le Soir. The meaning of the song and of these composers are, are very different from the last song. Um, Le Soir is a piece that is very philosophical in meaning. It describes a poet's desire to be happy and live life to the fullest because life can end before you know it. And it is conveyed through metaphors of nature and flowing streams. And so I felt that Sunset at Ivory by Armand Guillemin perfectly captured these moments. And so before we go any further, let me perform for you a little story. between singer and piano, and it basically symbolizes that push and pull relationship that are happening between them. And this is a metaphor for how humanity, in this case, works with and against nature at times, and vice versa. So the symbolism happens again through the piece, especially at the climax, as it's shown here, especially at the word beautiful or both. The singer holds this for around five counts at forte before dropping very sharply, where they sing quieter and more soft. Um, this serves as a metaphor of the quick interruption of life and its joys. The moment resolves. 
dissolved to the piano or to dim mold fill or with the next several measures thereafter, symbolizing the fast ebbing out of life at the end. Um, the ending of the song also, another metaphor that's shown between life and death, the last two lines are sung by the singer are very quiet, very soft, and the piano, meanwhile, uh, sings a very large, and excuse me, large range from low to high, but we're finally finishing at the time. This large sweep acts as a metaphor for the soul rising. Also, it's at this point that the singer piano really shared true rhythmic synchronicity, and this symbolizes the unification of the poet with nature. So with the painting, this echoes the wave-like flowing feeling of the song through the river imagery and even the billowing smokes in the background. And it also shows that, What's interesting is that nature is actually in the foreground of this piece, whereas humanity or this factory is in the background. And that shows how strong that nature is in this painting, but also in depth of this piece. But at the same time, it shows that humanity is always right there and that it's always going to be there, even if it ends. So, moving on. The last piece that I will sing for you, um, at this point, philosophy is fully out the window with this. Uh, instead, Debussy showcases his skill uh, in depicting illustrations through his music. So the last piece I'll perform for you is titled Clairvoyant. It is depicting the singer or the poet observing a fête galant, or a gallant festival. And this is where people are wearing masks and they're basically having a giant party under the moonlight. Uh, the artwork that I picked for this is James Whistler's Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Following Market. Um, and you can see it's a little different from our previous pieces, but it really helps to capture the mood of the piece. But before, without further ado, let me perform for you by Dorian.
a very ethereal atmosphere and tries to capture that mystical feeling of this midnight rendezvous. Another example is when the piano actually at times will depict the lute. Um, here the singer basically is singing, playing the lute and dancing. And so Debussy has the piano imitate that exact sound just to give it a little more of that feeling that he's trying to paint. But the most interesting and also for me the most frustrating part of Clandaloon is that vocal shifting of ranges and sound by the singer. The singer is literally all over the place in this piece. It's never in one high part, it's never in one low part. So the singer uh, basically is acting and trying to illustrate and depict the characters that are in the song. In this case, these really crazy festival goers. On this, it actually happens at a song's climax, which is a perfect example to show right here. The singer on point is singing about triumphant love and opportune life, and that is where the climax occurs. And this is trying to show the rigorousness and the triumphant love and life that this character is feeling at the party. But the following action of this climax is sadder and it's a little more minor sounding. And that is also portraying how these characters are also a little doubtful about their happiness and they're hiding behind these masks. So all this is a way to really try to illustrate that point that Debussy is trying to paint. So when it comes to Whistler's piece, it's very abstract and I know that really worked with this piece. Um, the visualization of these very erratic characters is shown here, even though it's not quite distinct. Um, Basically what he's trying to do is he's trying to capture that feeling of the night sky, but also of the emotions he's feeling. And that really connects with the emotions that Debussy feels in the sense of looking at these characters. Also, it's a little hard to see here, but there are some figures towards the bottom of the painting that they're very ghost-like. And that also echoes that translucent appearance of these festival goers as they're acting. So you don't know why they're happy exactly or why they're sad, but still they're there. And besides that, the darker tones of the piece really do go with those darker tones in the song. So to wrap everything up, the art and music of Impressionism really encompasses the ideology of portraying mood and experience. It's about feeling and perceiving more than anything. And I came to understand this better even in my own research. I was able to enhance my own performance of Debussy pieces by associating and visualizing with a piece of art. And this gave me a clear image into exactly how I wanted to emote of the song by visualizing some art with it. And also, I do hope that you too were able to enjoy experiencing my singing and art and were able to have your own nice, impressionable moment. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. <laughs>- I mean, did you take the time? I mean, I know you were concentrating mainly on the art and the music, but did you take the time to sort of like try and draw some sort of uh, cohesive t tissue between the art, the music, and the poetry? Oh, the poetry, yes. So I researched how the poetry is about the symbolism of the yeah. time, and the symbolism movement was a big part of the impressions of it also, but it was all with literature. So breaking that down, it was nice to try to figure out how they're trying to emote this at the same time, but that's the extent that I went to would it like help and like did that sort of influence which paintings you yes, picked? It okay. Did. Yeah. So for instance, uh, a lot of things we tell were very moonlight esque and sunset esque. So finding those lyrics like Beauvoir is all about an evening and a sunset and rivers flowing. So I was like, oh perfect. This piece is great because it talks the same thing. Cool. Thank you. Any other Closer to you when she sings. When she sings yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm having a really hard time hearing. Too. Well, it person. makes it for a wide shot. Okay. I want um, to, this is the last one. It's going to look good.
intrigued by the concept of local production in the way that um, it's kind of evolved over time um, and then enhanced by certain performance aspects um, and those types of things. Um, so today I'm going to give you some practical takeaways and ways that you can apply that to your performances um, and things you want to do if you're interested in pursuing singing. Maybe you're just curious, maybe you're here just to support. Um, either way, hopefully you'll be able to take away some really great things from today. Um, I'm going to talk about so, uh, four key physical components um, that you can work with in uh, enhancing your performances um, and then how to apply each of those to different genres, which will be followed by demonstration of those key concepts in performances. So the first key component I'm going to talk about is posture. This is, after all, talking about how to fully incorporate the body into a vocal performance. Um, and a lot of people don't think that it is as difficult as it is, but I assure you that it is. Um, in life, we get kind of caught up in things that we're doing, whether it's at work, on the computer, or things that we're wearing, or maybe we're tired or exhausted, um, long day at work, maybe we're exercising a lot, we're just getting into a lot of bad habits, and poor posture just seems to be kind of a regular thing. Um, I know that I always notice when somebody has really great posture, and it kind of is just assimilated into culture. Um, it's kind of a shame because poor posture has a lot of negative um, health side effects. Um, I have a video here that's going to talk about that a little bit more. Has anyone ever told you, stand up straight, or scolded you for slouching at a family dinner? <laughs> Comments like that might be annoying, but they're not wrong. Your posture, the way you hold your body when you're sitting or standing, is the foundation for every movement your body makes and can determine how well your body adapts to the stresses on it. These stresses can be things like carrying weight or sitting in an awkward position and the big one we all experience all day, every day, gravity. If your posture isn't optimal, your muscles have to work harder to keep you upright and balanced. Some muscles will become tight and inflexible. Others will be inhibited. Over time, these dysfunctional adaptations impair your body's ability to deal with the forces on it. Poor posture inflicts extra wear and tear on your joints and ligaments, increases the likelihood of accidents, and makes some organs, like your lungs, less efficient. Researchers have linked poor posture to scoliosis, tension headaches, and back pain, though it isn't the exclusive cause of any of them. Posture can even influence your emotional state and your sensitivity to pain. So there are a lot of reasons to aim for good posture. But it's getting harder these days. Sitting in an awkward position for a long time can promote poor posture and so can using computers or mobile devices, which encourage you to look downward. Many studies suggest that on average, posture is getting worse. So I'm sure that you have noticed some of these things in your life. How often have you walked past somebody just looking at their phone like this? I mean, we're all guilty of it as well. Um, but like it says in the video, poor posture actually inhibits full lung capacity. Um, and as singers or somebody who's performing or really just for a good quality of life, you wanna make sure that you can breathe to your fullest capacity. Um, and the best way to do that is just to ensure that you're standing up correct, uh, standing up straight. Um, there are a lot of different variations, um, people standing up too straight, and those types of things. For yourself, it should just feel comfortable. Um, a good rule of thumb is sometimes when you put your arms above your head, bring them down to your side. You want to have your chest nice and raised, um, but not too uncomfortable. Um, just as a rule of thumb, setting yourself up really well to incorporate the next component. The next key component for singing is the diaphragm. This is really essential. Um, the diaphragm is basically a thin wall of muscle that separates your lower abdomen from your thoracic cavity, which contains your heart and your lungs. Um, when you inhale, your diaphragm contracts and pulls your lungs downward. Obviously, if you're not standing up correctly, your lungs won't move very far because you can't use them to their full capacity. So once you stand up straight and your diaphragm is engaged, you inhale. Um, and when you exhale, um, your lungs come back up. I have a video to demonstrate that as well. If you watch carefully, you can see the ribs expanding the way that it should with correct posture. When we are born, um, we are born knowing instinctively how to breathe correctly. But over time, through bad habits and maybe sports as a young child or different things, scenarios, um, we develop incorrect breathing habits. We often breathe in our chest. You see people when they're um, hyperventilating or things like that breathing up in their chest, and it is really awful. Um, it does not fill your lungs all the way, and it creates a lot of 
carbon dioxide going to your head, which can cause you to pass out, um, which is obviously not something that is desired. Um, so if you've ever been in a course or things like that, you'll say people, you'll hear people say things like, oh, use your diaphragm, breathe low, all these things, but what does that actually mean? Um, as a singer, you want to make sure that you're breathing into the lower third part of your, your abdomen here and you're engaging. Um, so when you stand up straight and you're really using your diaphragm, you can fill your lungs up um, and keep it engaged as you exhale. Um, that just ensures correct um, breathing and different things like that, which will help promote your singing. The next component we're going to talk about is the throat. Um, this one is a little bit less intuitive because there are a lot of things in your throat that you don't control. You just speak and you don't think about it. Um, but the throat is actually an extremely complex apparatus um, with many intrinsic and extrinsic muscles. I have a video here to kind of demonstrate that. It's actually a laryngoscopy, which is a scope that gets placed up someone's sinuses and down to the throat. It might be a little graphic for some people. And so if you, if you have to turn away, that's fine. Um, but it's really interesting to watch the way that vocal cords operate while we're talking. It's so much more extensive than you would think. Shapes. 
So when you say, ah, making sure it's nice and tall, things like that. Um, the last thing with the mouth that you want to watch out for, though, is tension. Your jaw and your tongue hold a lot of tension. And if you're not careful about that, it can affect your vocal cords negatively. Um, it can create sass vibrato or extra pressure that can also cause wear and tear, unnecessary wear and tear, on your vocal cords. I actually have a video kind of uh, illustrating the way that the tongue works. It's a massive muscle um, in, your, in your mouth and it goes all the way down the back of your throat. Um, it's actually connected to the same bone that your larynx is. Your larynx contains your vocal cords. And so when your tongue has tension, it is basically tug of war between your vocal cords. So when your tongue has tension and you don't even think about it, it's moving your, your vocal cords around like crazy. Um, so you can see why the tension can be a negative thing. Key of D major. Um, 
which is a, which is a standard. A lot of people, you know, major chords that kind of sound happy. Um, but the music doesn't actually convey that. Um, it uses a lot of bar chords, mixed chords, things that don't really fit into the key to create this sense of uncertainty, um, to convey a sense of anxiety, which is exactly what the lyrics say. Uh, the whole time is worrying about things and you know terrified that the night is going to come and take away their love and that's exactly what the music shows in the composition there's a point where it builds and even still as it resolves at the end it doesn't resolve with finality um, in the perfect cadence instead it resolves um, in an inversion and it leaves the audience kind of feeling unsettled which is actually which is exactly the point in an intimate setting and obviously if you understood german this would kind of reflect to you um, and kind of hit home about the kind of things that maybe you're concerned about in the 12th and 13th century so um, I have an example here um, of a young girl who is learning how to be a singer. She does a lot of really great things in this video, but I'm going to point out some things to you that she could work on, those four key components that we talked about. Obviously in this video, she is not, doesn't have the best posture. Her hands are folded in front of her. So that's going to affect her lung capacity and her air support. At the beginning of her phrases, um, it sounds a little bit breathy, um, and her vibrato is a little bit uneven. So this could point to a lot of different issues that she's having, maybe some tone tension, some support, things like that. So as we watch this and now you realize what this song is supposed to convey, um, see if you connect with it, is she emoting very well? Those types of things. This is a non-example. And as, as performers and singers and people who appreciate music, it's really good to listen to performances and learn from them and grow. She is obviously a student and there are a lot of great things going on and she will even learn from this recording of herself. Um, but just try and watch for some of those things that I've pointed out. It's a very short video.
Um, I was using all the physical components I was talking about to only aid the other training that I had. Um, you could connect with it, the emotion was a lot more prevalent in that performance. So when you're doing those kinds of things, realize that you don't have to be doing a lot of flashy things to really try and convey the meaning of the piece. The next style I'm going to be talking about, the next genre, is Broadway. Um, Broadway is kind of cool because it didn't really start as its own genre. It evolved from, um, actually a long time ago, slaves who came over from Africa um, mixed their African style songs with the Anglo-Saxon hymns that were already in America from the colonials and kind of formed their own um, slave songs that they would sing in the fields, which then evolved into gospel, eventually minstrelsy, and then Broadway was born. It kind of seems like a counterclockwise, backwards way of creating it, but it kind of did come out of that. Um, so because Broadway has its own um, unique beginnings, it also has its very unique sound. Um, in this golden age, after the Great Depression, uh, shows like Oklahoma came out, which really allowed Broadway to kind of take off and, and start doing its own thing, and really people started coming in to appreciate it as its own genre. Some of the more Broadway techniques that you'll hear are these big, loud high notes that are very distinctive, and there's not usually a lot of vibrato, it's a little bit less um, than opera or leader or recital type pieces, which I just did. Um, and so there's gonna be a lot more acting out. It's similar to opera in that there are musical numbers, but there is talking between. There's more character development and storyline and plot, things like that. Um, so there's more acting and dramatics that get incorporated into the technique. Um, one specific example I have is the story goes on. This is from a show called Baby by Jonathan Larson, and um, basically the premise of the show is that there are three groups of uh, couples who find out that they're pregnant in different stages of life. This song in particular zooms in on a college girl who finds out that she's pregnant, and it's kind of realizing how awesome it is that she's pregnant, experiencing this life inside of her, knowing that past generations have felt this and generations to follow her. She's just part of a much bigger picture. Um, it's kind of beautiful, and it, you can see that reflected in the composition, it kind of starts out a little bit unsure, kind of contemplative, and you can hear that in the chords and uh, some of the dissonances. It starts lower in the chest voice, um, which is the voice that I'm speaking in now, um, and kind of moves gradually higher and higher. Broadway is very unique in that it has kind of created its own style of singing, basically. It mixes the chest voice and the head voice, like the opera voice, together to create something called a belt. So the higher you move up, to get that really dramatic sound, you belt which is a mixture between the two, which is much healthier um, than just, I guess, using your chest voice that high, screaming, basically. Um, so I have a quick demonstration here of a girl who is also in a conservatory, and she created an audition video. Um, there are a lot of really great things going on here, uh, but just to point out a couple things that she might not be demonstrating from the components we talked about. Her voice does have a nasal quality to it, um, which might show that she's not using her resonators correctly. Um, she shouldn't have a nasally tone if she's using them correctly. Her vibrato is a little fast. Maybe that is indicative of some tension in her tongue or her jaw. Um, and you'll notice as she gets to the end of the piece where it starts getting really high in pitch, um, she doesn't switch into her head voice like she should. She instead just belts it. I mean, it sounds like it's yelling. Um, listening to it myself, it sounds a little bit painful. Um, and, when she, and when she gets to the end of the video, she doesn't really have a pleasant look on her face, so maybe it is painful. Um, but you'll be able to tell those things, so keep an eye on that while you're watching this performance and keeping those four key components we talked about in mind as well.
she was screaming there at the end. Um, when I'm gonna perform this, I am going to switch into a speak sing, which is almost like a head voice, which is much healthier. Um, after singing like that for a couple of years, you will quickly develop um, more serious vocal issues like vocal nodules, granulomas, things that require surgery for fixing um, will all, and will alter the voice for, forever. Um, there are a lot of really good things going on here. Um, she is uh, singing a Broadway style song, so there is more acting it out. And when you see me perform this, that's what you'll notice as well. Um, as I get ready to perform this, just keep in mind those four key components and some of the errors that she was doing it. Uh, she was doing and watch me incorporate some of the correct technique um, in this next performance.
on the different placements, I think I died did not scream like she did, and my voice feels fine. That's how your voice should feel. It's very intuitive in that way. If it hurts, you should probably stop. Singing should not hurt. The final genre that I'm going to look at is contemporary pop. These are people that you hear on the radio, maybe your favorite band, somebody that you analyze. Um, some techniques, there's even less vibrato um, than the Broadway style, and certainly much less than the classical style. Um, one of the themes um, for contemporary music and um, just how competitive things are getting is you want to have a lot of individuality in your voice, um, which creates things like Christina Aguilera, very distinct voice. Um, somebody like John Mayer, also very distinct voice. These, these types of voices that people create by affecting their voices, and it's making grab on you or sexy, whatever, whatever the, the goal and the intention behind that is. Um, more specifically, let's go ahead and talk about John Mayer, um, very successful performer, um, great artist. He basically ruined his voice because he wanted to have this individualistic style. Um, he was hurting his voice. He constantly wearing away at that skin that I was talking about, creating a lot of irritation, formed a granuloma, which is basically like this massive cyst on your vocal cords. He had to have surgery once to get it removed, came back, surgery again. Had to cancel a tour entirely, permanently postpone the release of an album, was devastating for his career, and even still, he has not come back in the way that he was performing before. However, these kind of concepts can be incorporated into the contemporary style. I get that it's about connecting to the music and expecting that and really just feeling and letting it all go, uh, but you do want to protect your voice. A good example of this is Lady Gaga, actually. We all know her, you know, her bad romance, poker face, those ridiculous outfits and dances. Um, but there is a lot to be said about the way that she sings. She does protect her voice well. She actually made it into NYU's Tish's Performing Arts Academy, which is extremely competitive, and she made it in when she was only 17. Um, she's been playing the piano forever, an incredible performer, one of uh, the best performance selling uh, record musicians ever. Um, so she's wildly popular and very famous and successful. Um, if you heard her sing at the Grammys earlier this year, she did a rendition of The Sound of Music in a beautiful classical style. Um, and then later this, uh, later after that, but still previously this year, um, she sang at the Super Bowl. She did the national anthem, incorporating different techniques. She did some belting, um, more of a Broadway style, some contemporary techniques, and then at the end also incorporated some classical techniques with some vibrato and her head voice. So she incorporates all these different styles and genres, and these four key components that we talked about, has preserved her voice beautifully and is wildly successful. Now, she is taking a step back from music, but not because she's damaged her voice, just because she wants to explore different avenues um, in her life. Um, one of the main people that we're going to focus on is Adele, though. Um, she went to the Brits Performing Arts Academy and got picked up four months after she graduated. Um, has been amazingly successful. Um, it was, she took her a little bit longer to pick up um, some popularity in America, but when she did, boomingly huge. Um, you know, she has these self-titled albums, 19, 20, 21. After her record 21 in 2011, um, she actually did have some vocal damage. She had a vocal hemorrhage, which is basically a black eye on your vocal cords. Those tiny little delicate membranes, um, she was smashing them together so hard, they started to bleed internally, um, which she couldn't even speak. There was no sound coming out. They were so damaged that they wouldn't even come together. Um, she had to have surgery to have this fixed. It's happened multiple times, and that's just due to the style of singing very forceful, gospel, rock, those kinds of things. Um, she's very R&B, kind of even gospel in her technique, and it is very, very difficult on the voice. Um, just forceful singing can cause this to happen. After she took a step back and she just released her, her newest album, if you'll notice, a lot, the singing is a lot different than in her previous albums. It's not as forceful or powerful in that way. It's still beautiful and really great singing, but I believe that she's taken a step back and reevaluated to increase the longevity of her voice and ensure that she has a musical career that kind of follows throughout. One of the songs I'm going to look at is Someone Like You. This is before she took a step back and kind of reevaluated what she was doing with her techniques. Um, this song, when it was first recorded um, and performed live, um, in the second part of the chorus, she would go up much higher and kind of push pretty hard, you know, the song I me part. I'm sure that all of you are familiar. Listening to this, it sounds kind of gravelly, and you're like, oh, that sounds great, that's awesome. But you're actually witnessing vocal damage as it's happening. Uh, which is also kind of painful to experience, um, and also wash. So she was allowing this to happen to her voice, um, and if you'll notice now, she doesn't sing like that. She sings it much lower. She's altered the way that she sings the song to protect her voice. I have a video kind of demonstrating that, so pay attention. It's, it's a recording. It's a music video, so you won't actually get to see any of the physical techniques that she's incorporating, but just listen to the way that she is using her vocal cords. <laughs> Sometimes. 
Um, she doesn't have any issues with vocal hemorrhaging anymore, um, but these are real concerns that you face if you um, decide to treat your voice like this. It's a very delicate apparatus and it requires a lot more care than you would think. I'm gonna sing this song now and demonstrate a way to sing that higher part in a, in a healthier way using um, the belt that we talked about before, going into the higher head voice like an opera um, in classical style. So just listen to those things. You can still um, have a great performance and you convey all of this emotion and the feeling um, of, of you know, the translation and the meaning of this song um, without ruining your vocal cords. <laughs>
what I've been talking about and go over those points again. Um, as a performer, and really just to improve quality of life in general, make sure that your posture is good to optimize, optimize your lung capacity. Make sure you're engaging your diaphragm so that way um, you have the, the necessary energy behind your vocal projection. Make sure that you're not hurting your voice. Even when you're speaking, whispering, screaming, all those things are awful for your voice. You can damage your voice and not be a singer. Um, so make sure you're just preserving um, your vocal cords and ensuring the longevity of um, your performing time. Um, make sure that when you are using um, your mouth as a filter that you're keeping your mouth open nice and wide. You're optimizing your resonators. Um, and you're making sure you don't have a lot of tension. Incorporating those things is only going to improve um, your performances um, and the way that you produce vocal sound. Um, if you're really serious about pursuing um, a vocal career or potentially just improving your voice in general, I would really encourage you to think about taking lessons. Um, just as you know, everybody's anatomy is different and you want to figure out what works best for you personally, and working one-on-one -on -one as a team with a vocal instructor is really beneficial. Um, I hope that you took some things out of today that you can implement into your own lifestyle, your own performances, things like that. Or maybe you just learned some things about the voice that you didn't know before. Um, but yeah, I hope this was uh, informative and I hope you enjoyed it.